Welcome everybody to the One Voice Washington DC update on COVID and public policy developments. I'm Paul Nathanson with uh, Bracewell. I, um, this is our, we were trying to figure it out before this webinar, but we're gonna say it's over 30 uh, webinars we've done. Uh, we haven't talked to you in a while, so we have a lot to catch up on as always. I am joined by uh, my colleagues from Franklin Partnership, Omar Nashashibi and John Guzik. And we have a new face today, or a new person, uh, George Felsen, uh, is with me from the Policy Resolution Group at Bracewell. Uh, George and I have worked together for, oh, going on 17 years, and he has been involved in uh, manufacturing issues for that long and was um, working with me on NTMA and PMA issues before Caitlin came along. For those who know Caitlin Sickles, she uh, is on maternity leave. She had a baby boy, Rowan Jack Sickles, uh, in late October, and uh, I am in touch with her, and she is doing great, and she looks forward to coming back uh, uh, at the, the, she'll be gone for the, till the end of the year, but uh, so congrats out there to Caitlin in case she's tuned in. Um, there's plenty of ways that you can um, get to us uh, and listen to us. Uh, we have the One Voice, uh, our, our Talking with One Voice podcast, um, which is available on all your podcast platforms, uh, Apple, you know, Spotify, you name it. Uh, we have just put up a new episode this week, so uh, we are going to talk about some of the issues like reconciliation, and we go into more, uh, some additional detail on the podcast, so I highly recommend that you listen to it. It's a quick listen. Uh, and then if you like us, you know, please indicate that on the, your podcast platform. And if you don't like us, then don't do anything. Just hang, then stop listening to it. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to John Guzik and to get us started, John. Well, thanks, Paul. And it has been a while since we've all gotten together. And so we do want to update you the latest on the Paycheck Protection Program that was success, so successfully utilized by the PMA and NTMA members. Uh, talk you give you a COVID update and some of the regulatory issues with OSHA and CDC revolving that. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about about the item of, uh, item of the news today in Washington and for the past month and probably the next month or two is the, the infrastructure bill and taxes. And then we're going to talk supply chain and tariffs moving forward. So as many of you know, the PPP uh, program loan program has expired in May. It is unlikely that a a new PPP loan program will be will be regenerated. The economic injury a disaster loan program through the Department of Commerce, that is still open, um, but just unlike the PPP program, which is a forgivable loan, the EIDL loan program is not forgivable. Um, for those of you who are on this webinar, if you have not applied for your loan forgiveness uh, from the first or second draw, we encourage you to do this right away. Um, the SBA, probably since our last webinar, has opened up a direct forgiveness portal, and these are for PPP loans of under $150,000, and that is if you're if the banks are okay, have okayed it. Um, I, I just read a release from the Small Business Administration today that they have forgiven over 1 million loans under the 150,000 uh, under the 150,000 loan amount mark, and the number of banks that are participating in the direct uh, direct loan program through SBA has continued to increase as well. And then we've also, those of you who have had loans over $2 million, if you recall from way back when, there was a, there was a requirement that there was a necessity questionnaire. And we we're uh, very pleased that the necessity questionnaire uh, was, was repealed. So that's no longer necessary. And they're, they're uh, starting to more rapidly approve some, forgive some of those loans over the $2 million mark. And just want to remind everybody, the employee, tax, employee Retention Tax Credit, the ERTC, is still available for now. And if those of you who are interested in it, we do encourage you to take advantage of it because we are hearing that there are some policymakers and lawmakers in Washington who are interested in seeing the ERTC um, end in the fourth quarter. So just keep that in mind moving forward. Under this next slide, this is just a, a screenshot of what the SBA direct loan forgiveness portal looks like. And so for those of you who, who 
would qualify with a loan of $150,000, print the slate off, hand it off to your finance people so they can initiate the process for forgiveness. And then for those over 150, again, we wanna re reiterate, make sure you get your uh, forgiveness application in right away. Omar? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, just one quick item here on, on this last area on the employee retention tax credit. I, I do think to John's point, this is likely going away. And so it's important for folks to understand that you've got only a matter of time left. The reason that John and I believe that is because it was scored. Score means how much would it raise in federal revenue if it was taken away? It would raise $8.2 billion just in the final quarter of 2021 alone. And that means that they could be able to use that $8.2 billion to fund the bipartisan infrastructure framework that John will go through in a little bit. So that's why we do believe we do not expect to see the ERTC available in the final quarter. Likely that could potentially be a retroactive change, but please keep in mind there are a few other options that are available, especially when we go into some of the vaccination conversations and some of the paid time off but those also are starting to expire on September 30th if you participated in those voluntary programs. So I know we don't have much time left in this calendar month and ahead of that September 30th deadline, but those that are working on vaccinations and having the time off and looking to have the credits reimbursed, please check with the IRS website on there. But to John's point, even though that the SBA's PPP loan is now closed in May, we still do have the Small Business Administration IDLE programs, 7A and 504s, and a number of other ones that are still available for lending. The reason that we're pointing out the IDLE loan right here is because recently the SBA has agreed to increase the limit. This was an act of Congress that we worked with and to pressure rather SBA to increase their lending limit, especially as the PPP phased out. So now you can get a maximum loan at $2 million. While many of us had been hopeful this would have moved much more quickly, even as early as April, when this was first announced that they would begin approving loans under the idle of 500,000 or more, we at least now have a date. The portal to submit that information is already open under IDLE under the SBA website. So we do suggest that you already go there if you do intend on asking for one of these types of loans from the SBA. But to John's point, again, it is not forgiven. So that is something that it is important for you to continue to track, but this is another funding opportunity. The October 8th is the date where they will start approving. So the portal is open. We encourage you to take a look at that. One other item that we did just want to mention here quickly is that we want to remind folks that the federal unemployment subsidies did end on September 5th. John, I don't think we're going to see another round of at least on the federal side, but I do believe that the states, they are permitted to use some of their leftover COVID funds. Are they not for some of that funding? Yeah, I, and the president has indicated he doesn't want the program extended, but has grant, they have granted if the state has received COVID dollars that they could use some of that for it. But I think they've gone into other areas and we'll talk about a little more when we talk about the infrastructure program you know the, the advancement of child tax credits and stuff and so you know it, 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 while the extended unemployment benefits are no longer there at the federal level there are other federal benefits out there uh, for workers who perhaps have children that's right so let's just jump right into the employee vaccine mandate and we want to start with the obvious caveats that we are not attorneys we are going to provide you some information here that does come from the law firm of bracewell that paul's and george's group work with but we do want to at least start giving you an idea of what might potentially be out there more importantly there's certainly going to be challenges and we as associations have not taken a position opposing or supporting this specific action by osha because we don't know what they're going to say Right now, we're gonna to try to tell you what we do know based on our conversations with OSHA and other folks around town that will ultimately lead to how we respond as associations and then how you all respond as individuals. But I think by now, this is a few weeks old, you already know that it's requiring all employers with 100 employees or more to require vaccinations or testing. The, re the reason we'll put this up here, this triggers what's called an emergency temporary standard. If you were on our previous webinars, you'd recall that you already have the ETS with regards to healthcare workers, and we had one previously last year. This is again what OSHA is doing right now, is going to is being told to create a second emergency temporary standard. Quickly, so you know what this will mean, it'll be out there for six months, and then they will turn it into a permanent standard or for a further time being or revisit it 
there. But John, on this one, we just wanted to really highlight the words that are highlighted there. This affects subcontractors if already. So the previous slide was looking what they're going to come out for all private employers, but you subcontractors to the federal government, John, they should start taking taking notice now. Absolutely. And and as you had mentioned that the OSHA is preparing this ETS. And as this next slide shows out, this is just a number of the questions that the folks at Bracewell have put together that the ETS, that the OSHA is going to have to deal with in answering many of the questions that we have already received from many NTMA and PMA members. Well, how is this going to be implemented? And what do I pay? What am I responsible for paying for? What is the employee responsible for paying for yeah. with, with the testing and such? And so this is a very complex uh, emergency temporary standard that the president is basically put in in the lap of of OSHA and we're still waiting. The OSHA announced that you know on September 9th that they were going to start writing this at temporary standard and that they were going to you know get it out within the next couple of weeks. Well, it's been a couple of weeks and we still haven't received anything yet and so we do we are we do recognize that OSHA has a very difficult job out there in writing these standards to address many of these questions that are that are pointed out on this slide. Yeah, so let's just start with some of the premise, because I know a lot of folks have in their mind, and we always have to look at, you have a personal opinion, a professional opinion, and right now, where are we with regards to some of the professional questions that we've gotten to, to answer? The first one that I, I we typically do get from a political or a personal standpoint is, how can OSHA do this? So let's start with the question on how. There is language in the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 that President Nixon signed into law that says that OSHA may move forward with an emergency temporary standard if that the employees are exposed to a grave danger. Under the previous administration, we did see that in the past, they did say that the ETS is justified. So under the Trump administration, they did cite in some ways that yes, we are looking at the issue of COVID as a grave danger. And that's a lot of ways what this administration will hang their hat on that this is necessary to move forward on. So this is how OSHA is gonna justify it. We did just get a couple of questions that I'd like to just quickly pause on if we could. And I'm gonna roll back one quick slide to the subcontractors and I apologize for the back and forth. But here's a question we just received. When we say subcontractor for federal government, does that go down to the subs of subs? How, down, how far down does the supply chain go? I'd like to point out the two yellow, if you're looking in on the webinar itself, we have highlighted the word contractors twice. If you notice the second highlight there, I'll read this quickly for those listening on the phone. Include a clause that the contractor and any subcontractors at any tier shall incorporate into lower tier subcontractors. Again, not being an attorney, but believe that may answer the question that was just raised about how far to go. One could speculate that at any tier would argue that it goes further down. So that is one question that we have right there. And I'll move on and we'll answer some of the other questions related uh, on this here in the next slide, because John brought this up. These are very excellent questions. And before we go to put more detail into what John just discussed, I'm gonna pause and answer a second question that was asked. The question is, we have hard enough time getting people. This ruling for employers 100 plus is not helpful. This may drive people to smaller company. Also, who's picking up the cost for all this weekly testing? That is an excellent question. The cost for the weekly testing, that has been speculated that OSHA will address that. And when we did, we'll get in this in a couple of slides, we did have a call with OSHA on two Fridays ago on September 9th, uh, on four in the afternoon, and she did walk through that they will be addressing that. This is now pure speculation. They would likely address that in the form of some kind of a credit along the lines of those that have been expiring on September 30th, which is why I teased that a little bit earlier. But also breaking that down further, we'll get into the 100 employee question there a little bit more. But John's point here, I mean, how is OSHA going to expect, expect some of these employers to comply? And furthermore, if they go into even smaller shops, ultimately through some kind of regulations. But John, for, based on that webinar that we had on September 9th, they said it's coming in a matter of weeks. So it's not going to be drifting into Thanksgiving. They're working on it now. Yeah, they're working on it now. Um, just as a reminder, when OSHA was putting together the ETS for healthcare, you know, they set it. They set a deadline, and that was that was delayed. And I think that was an easier, perhaps, uh, animal to tackle than than this one, because as the previous slide pointed out, there's so many 
questions out there. And so, you know, they said it'll be, they're doing it in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think they had a week's advantage from when the president made the announcement. And so we are waiting. Uh, OSHA obviously has reached out to, to uh, folks like us to make sure we understand where they're coming from and they understand where, where we're coming from. Um, there's going to be a di differentiation from the OSHA standards from when those states who have their own OSHA, those states will have an additional 30 days to put together their state plan. But the folks at OSHA made it clear that, that all those states' plans uh, must be as strict as the federal requirements moving forward. And so that that is what uh, is the expectation at, this, at the state level. So uh, they also indicated that if you have people who are working remotely, um, who still have who interact with people from the outside, that they likely would fall under this emergency temporary standard. But to answer that question about the 100 person employee question, we do believe this emergency temporary standard is gonna be challenged legally by employees and employers. And one of the questions out there is, is you know, from the employee perspective, is there maybe a legal challenge to that 100 person worker standard? And that, that there, there may be an effort to you know, ha have the standard impact all employees. And so to the person who asked the question is hard enough time getting people if you're over 100 employees and that people only gonna work for the smaller companies, this temporary standard, likely it, one of the court challenges will do will be to eliminate that 100 per, that 100 worker standard so from the non-legal standpoint and just giving you from our perspective after now a year and a half hopefully you trust some of what we have to say part of the reason we say this is we look at other areas of labor law whether it's fmla or the aca and we look at the 50 the 25 and the 10 employee thresholds or even the 20 20 20 and over thresholds we could potentially see an employee to John's point come in there and challenge it and say, well, what about us? And I, we understand that they are trying to avoid a subbrief panel. That's a small business regulatory enforcement uh, flexibility act panel where you review the impact on small businesses. We were on a call last Friday with the small business administration office of advocacy who effectively speaks on your behalf. And we spent an hour in this round table talking about potential ways to support small businesses in this effort. We'd like to offer two editorial items, if we could, based on what we're hearing from other lobbyists and other people around town. And this is not about the mandate or about any position we would take. This is just information for you as tier ones and twos and threes. We are hearing the OEMs are talking about with the administration about supporting this, especially because they are concerned about going into the winter, more disruptions in supply chains. Many in the business community, and John, I'd like you to jump in here on the BRT in a second. Many in the business community and in the administration are looking at many of the medical device and other items potentially seeing disruptions. And this is a backdoor way. This is now me personally. I see them viewing this as conflict minerals where you have the OEMs tell their suppliers to, com to comply similar as you're seeing in some of the environmental and, and, and social issues that you're out there. So I would not be surprised if you're increasingly going to hear from your OEMs and your tier ones about one, the level of vaccination, and then two, if this mandate moves forward, their level of compliance. Because John, what did you say the other day about strange bedfellows? Yeah, that politics does lead to strange bedfellows because you've got the business roundtable and U.S. Chamber of Commerce supporting this ETS man, mandate for, for 100 workers, and then you got the labor unions. You know, this is a Biden proposal. The labor unions are opposed to this because they think labor should have a seat at the table to help make that determination. And so that is going to be another one of the legal challenges likely going to be coming from labor on how, you know, how labor is going to be addressed in this emergency standard. Yep, and we're coming up on, so we're coming up on 1220, so I want to keep us on time quickly. This is the last thing. This is, again, from the lawyers. What they are telling you, and most of you I know already have this, if you do not already have a written COVID plan, regardless of this ETS, we're hearing OSHA intends to ask for it. So even if this emergency temporary standard doesn't happen, please make sure your shop has a plan and also begin that process of assessing how many employees are not vaccinated and, honestly, how many you think might be unwilling and be able to address that you want to play both plan for the worst hope for the best obviously by now we should all be employing that two quick things i'd like to run through 
here is just on the CDC mask guidance was literally just updated yesterday for those of us like me with young children, but since we haven't spoken a few weeks ago, so I made some minor updates on the types of cloth masks and disposables. If you have any salespeople that are traveling to Europe on a European airline, you cannot wear a cloth mask. They will be wearing an N95 or the European equivalent. So please make sure that you've got those stocked up personally. Walgreens, Walmart, Amazon's all sold out. Check out some of the other items that have been recently posted in the last two weeks from CDC on this. And please note the awareness on the KN95. These are the China masks that are coming in. CDC is saying 60% of the KN95 masks are fake. Lastly, before I turn it over to John, again, reminder, this is more for employees that are making personal purchases rather for the business. But just as a heads up for you HR folks that are on here, click on this, might be able to help out one of your employees that is making some of these individual purchases out there. Home testing kits, that is increasingly going to be something this administration you see push out following the European models, everything we're seeing in the trends and reading publicly as well. So having those on stock, even in the shop, may not be a bad idea because you're going to see a run on those in the next 30 days. But John, let me turn it over to you since I know OSHA is moving forward on things outside of COVID as well. Absolutely, we are. We, uh, OSHA is is intent on issuing a heat rule sometime in October. So, what does this mean? It's it's for workers who are working indoor and outdoor, where the where where the heat index exceeds 80 degrees. OSHA is going to develop a national emphasis program. They're going to have a working group to to share how we can deal with uh, best practices in addressing this issue. Obviously. OSHA is targeting the construction workers and those people who work outside, but also people who work in factories and in very um, hot um, environments. What they're basically saying is they're going to prioritize intervention and then inspection. And so when you're in, in a workforce and the heat index, when this rule comes out, and we are just speculating at this point, is the first, the first thing will be as employers, we need to identify, hey, the heat's getting warm in the shop, we need to do something, and then what are we doing? Are we going to be, are we providing enough cold water and other necessary relief and, and break time for our, for our employees? And then there's going to be the inspection, I think, and the OSHA is going to prioritize, they're going to take some of their inspectors off from what they were doing to address some of these heat areas. And so just expect this rule sometime uh, that we expect in, in October of this year. Absolutely. Do not discount this rule, folks. It has long-term implications. I think that was well laid out by John. And lastly, here on OSHA, before we jump into the next segment, OSHA RFI uh, request for information came out in July for mechanical press that has been issued. Comments are due on October 26. Please let us know anything that you may be interested in submitting. We were, are working on comments on here. I would also note that it is not just looking at mechanical presses. They have also are going to look at pneumatic, CNC, other controls that are out there, hydro. So they are looking at uh, a number of areas with regards to a rule that has not been touched, as you can see, since literally 50, well, 50 years ago now. I used to say 40 years ago. Now it's at 50 years ago. But let's just jump into it. We're going to spend seven or eight minutes here on infrastructure and taxes and then close out with about five minutes on tariffs. But let me set John up quickly here by telling you about, since I've got the younger kids, about the Democrats' no good, very bad, ugly, upcoming series of weeks. So to set the stage for you, what we have coming up this week potentially, and some of these are changing, as John's about to tell you, that Pelosi's threatening to maybe put even more pressure, but she did promise moderates that on September 27th, starting thereabouts, they would have a vote on an infrastructure bill. Minus, that's an X. September 30th, progressives wanted to get a reconciliation vote. John's going to give us some commentary if we think that actually might happen. Note that the funding for federal surface transportation, roads, bridges, that will expire. That's a five-year bill that expires, six-year bill expires on September 30th. The government's going to run out of money. Zero of 12 spending bills passed. And for those of you that believe that actually shutting down the federal government is a good thing, it is not. You lose millions of dollars worth of GDP per hour when the federal government is shut down. I think the number is like 12 or something like that. And going on lines of defaults and then where are we in the deadlines and tax increases, John, they've got a lot of problems coming up in the next week that they've got to figure this out on the Democratic side. 
this is this is not a any partisan shot, but it's almost like a the Democrats in a are in a circular firing squad. You've got a number of moderate Democrats and roughly 45 very progressive liberal Democrats who just can't come to an agreement. But let's lay out where things are. The Senate passed a 1.2 trillion dollar hard infrastructure bill. That's roads, bridges, broadband. 19 Republican senators voted for it. So that is a bipartisan bill. That is the bill that Omar pointed out that, that the moderates in the House have cut a deal with Speaker Pelosi to get a vote on that this come, this next week. And uh, we do believe that the Speaker has indicated that the House will vote on it. The problem is the 45 progress. So, so this is a partisan measure and the House Republicans are whipping their caucus to oppose this bipartisan legislation because they don't like the second bill, which I'll talk about in a second. And so this is going to have to be passed primarily by, by by Democrats. We believe probably probably no more than 10 or 20 Republicans may vote for it. So it's going to have to be passed by an overwhelming number of Democrats. The problem is roughly 45 of the progressives, while they're okay with this hard infrastructure bill, they're concerned if the House passes this hard infrastructure bill, their wish list, the 3.5 trillion human infrastructure bill, which has expanded paid and family sick leave and green green energy expansion of green energy programs, higher taxes, you know, higher taxes on the rich. We'll talk about some of these in the future. That if the Congress passes the hard infrastructure bill, they're never going to pass this more difficult 3.5 trillion. So they want the progressives want them to be linked. The moderates do not. The moderates don't want 3.5 trillion dollars. And we're seeing it in the Senate where you've got Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema, two of probably a handful of Senate Democrat, moderate Senate Democrats, who do not want a $3.5 trillion bill moving forward. Just before we started this webinar, Speaker Pelosi indicated that she's going to bring up this reconciliation bill next week. They haven't even written the bill yet. The committees did their individual work. It, we had heard we have heard that the House Budget Committee is going to meet on Saturday for an opportunity to bring this bill up. The problem is if they bring up a three point five trillion dollar bill that passes the House, you put a lot of these potentially vulnerable Democrats to make them take a tough vote, knowing that this bill is never going to pass it. Three point five trillion is never going to pass the United States Senate. And so the Senate will make their changes. It's going to be a much lower bill. Manchin has said he wanted a bill between 1 million and 1.5, 1 trillion and 1.5 trillion. I think, Omar, I'm not sure what you think, 2, two trillion is a possible reasonable uh, middle ground since, you know, uh, the, the president and some want, and Bernie Sanders want 3.5, Manchin's want 1.5, a 2 trillion might be a middle ground. Um, and so if the Senate does pass that, then it goes back to the House and then those potentially vulnerable Democrats who already voted for 3.5 trillion, which includes a number of tax increases that when when we have been meeting with some of the these House moderate Democrats, that they are like they're like concerned about some of the uh, issues that are included in these tax provisions, that they're gonna have to vote on it again. So they've taken a tough vote and then in the end they're gonna have to vote on a bill that what they really wanted in the first place. Yeah, that's exactly right. And a lot of this is really Pelosi trying to save her members from taking a, what we call in this town, a bad vote. Why would you set your moderate members up that are potentially going to lose their seats next round if you don't think that you're going to have a bill that actually passes out of the U.S. Senate? And that's what she's trying to do. So we find ourselves right now in a situation we might call a pre-conference where they're trying to get to a certain place where they think their moderates can accept it and where they're not. But let me stop on these. And we're going to about start talking on the taxes side. Let me stop quickly on the infrastructure to answer a quick question. Do you expect infrastructure bill to require steel purchases under this bill to be US manufactured? The answer is yes. The answer is yes, there already is a provision in the Senate passed bill that does deal with the steel, uh, steel and other part and manufactured goods and does reinforce that. There is also language in there that makes waivers more difficult when you're applying to the Department of Transportation. Those of you that, re that work in this space recall under the Service Transportation Act that Don Young pushed through a number of years ago, they created a waiver process to allow for that Buy American issue, and they made it even tighter under this bill that moved through the Senate the other day. And we believe that language is likely to remain in whatever the House does move forward with 
as well. But let's just jump right into uh, what I'd like to pause for a second. I usually, we hesitated to put this slide up. We do not like to put up slides that we do not believe will be a final outcome. I do not believe you're looking at final outcomes. I think what you should take away from this slide as us having done this for many years is when you start to see common themes appear among the negotiators, you should assume that that issue will be addressed. You should accept the numbers and the percentages as a variable but you should accept that the topic will likely be in a final package. What I mean by that is the final percentages and the final numbers and the final years might change. But we do believe, based on the House and the Senate and the White House, all on the same page, on addressing the issues you see on this screen. Those include some types of limitation to the Section 199A. What in that space they're particularly going to look at are going to be those that are earning over 400 and 500,000 and also those that are not claiming income as business income that have multiple companies. So you are going to see a, a massive hit on some, for some of our folks that are reporting income that are over 400,000 there. The individual rate, not a surprise. The corporate, inco the corporate rate, that's a negotiating maneuver. It will be 25% if they end up finalizing something like this. The capital gains, uh, those of you that are involved in transactions, you can read on your screen, it's gonna go up by 5%. Potentially, even if it does not go up, whatever the changes they make to capital gains is gonna be retroactive, likely to September 13. So if you had a deal close on the 14th, no, they will likely be subject to the retroactive capital gains transaction is everything that we are hearing that's out there. One thing that did catch us by surprise on here, although it was we were successful on stopping the step-up basis that would have caused the most harm to our members there, is on the estate tax, we did think they would change the rates. Right now, they're moving up the effective date, meaning they're trying to capture money. So right now, instead of going from the 5.47, 5.49 million per individual, 11.7, per couple is what it will revert to on 2022. That is their plan. The Democrats would move that up from 2026. I'd like to also just pause quickly on retroactivity since a previous slide did talk about taxes on January 1st of 2021. There have been some discussions about how far they go back retroactivity, uh, retroactively on certain items. The only spaces as of now we're hearing they're looking to go backwards would be on items dealing with unrealized gains, capital gains, estate tax, those areas. On the statutory rates of the C-Corps and the pass-throughs, most of those we're hearing is gonna be a January 1 of 2022. So anything that they move updates, it's because they're trying to move up some money. But John, just yesterday, we had this quote menu, and we always like to say, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. So we're hearing that there is an actual menu of what taxes that might be acceptable to increase over the coming months. Yeah, supposedly the uh, speaker and the Senate Majority Leader came to a, an agreement on principle on what the, the revenue provisions. Keep in mind, we talked about a $3.5 trillion human infrastructure bill paid for by $2.2 trillion in tax hikes that Omar just pointed out. And and I agree with Omar that we hesitate to tell you exactly what these tax hikes are gonna be, because if that $3.5 trillion number goes down to 2.5 trillion or 2 trillion, you don't need the $2.2 trillion in additional taxes. And so that is the negotiating room moving forward. And that is why we are, we are uh, using caution and telling you, you know, what is going to happen. But to Omar's point, those key themes are out there. There may be, there may be a haircut for the small business deduction. And, you know, the corporate, I agree with Omar, the corporate rate's likely gonna end up at 25%. The top, the top individual rate likely will stay the same because there is a strong push, you know, to, to tax the rich and stuff. But it's all negotiable depending on what that final number is. And when the president this past week met with a, group of moderate and liberal Democrats, the president was frustrated because he kept saying to Manchin and others, like, give me your top line number. And they wouldn't give that number. Well, I would argue Manchin has. He said a trillion to 1.5 trillion. But until they can come up with a number, they're not going to know what revenue they're going to need to raise it. Although, having said that, Pelosi and, and Schumer have already said they have come to an agreement in principle on the revenue, but not knowing what their top line is. Yeah, so sit tight. I, I think over the next week or so, we're going to get a better sense of where we stand. 
And so please take with a, a grain of salt what we put up here. Again, we hesitate to put things up for some of the, especially the CFOs to start planning, but you do need to start planning for the worst. Again, hope for the best that's out there. And please, this is where we are very much shaming you, all of you. Um, your taxes are gonna go up, folks. Let's be honest, whether it's going backwards or forwards, please send an action alert. We have posted this uh, a couple of weeks ago. We just sent another one this week. Please send a letter to the US Congress. They need to hear from you. The moderate Democrats, some of these folks, Stephanie Murphy, uh, there's a, another Congressman Trader from, um, from Oregon that's been really helpful to us. They've been really getting our back on a lot of these areas. And that's in the divided Congress that we have, any handful of three to four Democrats is all we need to hold this up. Here's what we have to tell you. The combined NTMA and PMA membership is roughly 2,000 companies. We sent out an action alert on September 8th saying, please tell them no to harmful taxes. 16 individuals responded. Please folks, if you wanna save yourselves from what's happening, please send an action alert now. Literally, John, when you were on Capitol Hill, you took notice of this quickly, didn't you, when folks weighed in? Every office and those who've come to Washington for the legislative conference, you've seen the those young staffers who are answering the phone every day and they're listening and getting feedback from the constituents who are calling. That's those people who are calling that senator or members of Congress office is generally based on an action alert like this. We are asking you to send to make it easy. We're not asking you to call your senator or member of Congress. We'd love it if you did, but this is just clicking a button, typing in your zip code, and a letter automatically is generated to your senator or member of Congress. As the more senior level staff, they then monitor those calls and those letters and, and, and emails that come in on a daily basis and transfer that information along to that policymaker to let them know, okay, this is what we're hearing today. And it does make a difference. And I agree with you, having only 16 of our members uh, respond to the previous one. You know, I know we're all busy out there, but uh, this is very important. And and you know, this is this is you know, we say if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. If we if we are not able to uh, respond in greater numbers, we will be on the menu. Yeah, and if you don't think raising taxes on companies and people isn't popular, you haven't been paying attention to populist uh, populist uh, politics of the last six years. So in the last five minutes, why don't we just do a quick setting up the stage for we hand it over to our colleagues over at Bracewell. I want to touch on the top part is on China. The uh, 301 tariffs with regards to China are certainly going to remain in place. Our informed speculation is they will not be lifted at 25 or 7.5% on China prior to November of 2022. If there is a change, they could remove some products, particularly from either list one or list four. So either more of the industrial is one, IP is two. So we don't see much change there. Some possible three, but really on four is consumer. You could see some items coming off a list in the course of the next 14 months with others coming on. There's speculation, rumors were floated last Friday that they might add another 301 action against China for industrial subsidies. Keep in mind the ones Trump put in place are for IP theft. So that would even expand and add more on there. That could potentially be a pressure point. We do still, or we are still hearing about some issues with regards to opening and exclusion process. That potentially still could appear by the end of this calendar year. We do are working, we do are aware of some that that are putting a lot of pressure with regards to the administration there. But if we could turn it over to the folks over at Bracewell, we have had some development since our last discussions with regard to the 25% tariffs on steel and 10% tariffs on aluminum and conversations with the European Union. Yes, it, it, the, there are negotiations going on right now between the US and the EU regarding the 232 steel tariffs. Um, there is a deadline that the EU set of November 1st, as you may recall when, uh, from our previous webinars, that the EU placed retaliatory tariffs on uh, US exports um, as a result of the 232 tariffs of 25% and said that they would raise them to 50% to double them unless the US uh, withdrew the, uh, terminated these tariffs. Uh, that goes on popular, uh, the tariffs are on popular items including um, including uh, Kentucky bourbon. Uh, so in the original deadline was June by the EU uh, and the alcohol industry in the United States got very active. Uh, the US was su uh, successful in negotiating a, um, 
a suspension of that of, of the plan to double those tariffs. Uh, so they've agreed to negotiate, um, and that uh, the the EU said they would not double the tariffs uh, if they can get an agreement. First, they said by the end of the year. Now we're hearing by November 1st. So those negotiations are go are ongoing. Media reports have said that the U.S. is going to offer a uh, as uh, a solution a tariff rate quota, which means that you're able to import a certain amount of steel without a tariff, and then when the quota is hit, then a tariff is applied. Uh, this is not a great solution for us um, or for any steel user. However, we do believe that um, the Biden administration is not going to uh, just simply lift the tariffs and not replace them with something. Uh, we would prefer a monitoring program for steel imports, not a tariff rate quota. And so we are raising concerns regarding the uh, TRQs. We are also focused on expanding, um, uh, ensuring that if they reach an agreement with the EU that um, other close allies, for example, Japan and South Korea, where we know a lot of our members import steel are also included in a, um, in a similar agreement. Um, we are also reminding the administration that if this infrastructure bill uh, when it passes, that it will even suck up more steel out of the uh, supply chain, particularly because, as our questioner had asked that, and that we answered that um, it, there is a requirement for these infrastructure projects to use um, U.S.-made steel. So, um, so you know, more to come on this. I don't think the media reports have been uh, very accurate on the TRQ. It's certainly something that the administration is pushing. It's unclear. Uh, the EU has resisted or have said no to TRQs in the past. Um, I did get a call from the EU representative after the reports were out, and she uh, had said that she had talked to her colleagues, and uh, they had not made any indication that they were going to accept the TRQ. So um, more to come on this. Um, we'll keep you posted on these negotiations. We do believe that once they could negotiate an EU, a deal with the EU that, um, and which will set a precedent that hopefully Japan and South Korea will follow and then followed by others. Uh, and they can get back to focusing on the real issue, which is China overcapacity in steel. Yeah, because as you can see from the slides that the folks at Brace will keep out there, that clearly the prices are, are quite a bit, Paul. And the way we refer to it is you've got your Chinese uh, competitors and your European counterparts, and right now it's not just about price; it's it's about lead time. And I think John, your or Paul rather, your team with, with George have done a great job with the Wall Street Journal's gotten a lot of attention out out there as well that I know we're, we're going to talk about. But one other issue we just want to quickly touch on, and and John, if you want to lead us in, we know we've had some challenges with not just traditional steels that we've all we're starting to get into specialty metals, and, and John, we're hearing a lot of issues on on stainless as well. And this is just a you know a list of a number of the concerns that we've heard from from many of you uh, on, on stainless. You know the shutdown of El, of Allegheny. You know mills not meeting meeting capacity needs. You know uh, folks who are on allocation. And these are the challenges that is only exacerbating the challenges that you saw in those previous slides on you know hot rolls and cold rolls and on plate. Is now we're now we're seeing that at stainless and other specialty metals as well. And so uh, continue to share with us the concerns. Uh, policymakers are very interested in, in learning more about this. This, this. this stainless issue that has come, come up recently has been relatively new for policymakers. So keep uh, sharing with us your concerns. Absolutely. Thank you. And turn it back over to Bracewell. Yeah, just a reminder, uh, I know uh, there are um, media volunteer uh, forms that uh, NTMA and I believe PMA has now, and we urge you to uh, fill those out. This is an article from today. Um, this resulted from the uh, PMA business conditions report where we uh, received a call from the Atlanta Journal Constitution, connected uh, the reporter with uh, a Georgia manufacturer, uh, D. Barnes. They had a nice conversation. Uh, she got a quote and a link to her uh, company website in today's story, and also uh, Dee told me that that the um, reporter is interested in visiting her plant. So a lot of good things can happen 
uh, with for your company when uh, you volunteer with the media. I was on the phone with Dee. I prepped her for it. We did. We went over some talking points, so she was well prepared. Uh, not only is it good for your company, but we really need your help, uh, particularly on all these issues, taxes, tariffs. Um, it really helps to have uh, voices from folks who are on the front lines there and uh, manufacturers. Um, I get requests constantly. So thank you to all your media volunteers. And just a reminder that uh, a week from today is manufacturing day. Um, so if you please keep NTMA and PMA informed of your plans, uh, also drop me a line. We're always happy to help uh, promote you on social media. Uh, any uh, alert your local media about uh, any events that you're doing. Again, this is a great opportunity to promote your company, to promote both associations, and uh, as important or most important is to promote the manufacturing sector and the manufacturing industry. Thanks, Paul. And John, you want to close us out on support for associations? And yeah, I want to thank all of you who have stepped up and given generously to both PMA's Advocacy Fund and NTMA's GAF. Um, I want to give a shout out to, to Troy Turnbull and PMA. PMA's West Michigan District had a golf outing a few weeks ago where they raised $13,000 for advocacy. But not to be outdone, NTMA is holding at their annual meeting at the end of October a, a casino night and raffle. And I know some NTMA members are putting together some very generous gifts to be raffled off. And they will be raising money for their for their government affairs fund at the NTMA meeting. So we do appreciate those who have already given. If you haven't, if you're a PMA member and haven't given, we, we hope you will consider contributing. Those NTMA members who haven't given, you can give now or wait till the annual meeting at the end of October if you're gonna be there in Washington, DC, participate in their casino night and raffle. But thank you. Thanks so much, John. We'll make sure everybody has a link to that action alert. Usually it's one contact per company, but those should have, the most recent action alert just went out about 36, not even that, 24 hours ago. Yeah, 36 hours ago, Wednesday afternoon. So we will uh, get that to folks. Answering a couple of questions, if I could quickly. Thought I read the proposed corporate rate, this is a tax question on C corporations. Thought I read the proposed corporate rate of 25 or 26.5% is the top rate. Rates on earnings up to 5 million would remain unchanged or possibly be lower. Is that accurate? What is currently proposed? This is referencing the U.S. House of Representatives and their current proposal. What the House is representing is that earnings from zero up to 399,999 for C corporations are taxed at 18%. That would be a reduction from the 21% currently in place. For those businesses, 400,000 up to $5 million that's currently gonna be retained at the 21% rate. Those that are the 5 million and over, that would be subject to the increase of 26.5%, or we can all make an assumption if that final number is 25%, that would be, again, only the House proposal. We will see where it ends up with regards to the US Senate and the final negotiations. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight, but please remember we are still not that far away john and i still think we may not see something closer to a final package until november or even early december that's out there we'd like to answer one other question jumping back to the small business administration economic injury uh, disaster loan program the idle loans that were at 150,000 initially and then some folks applied for the initial increase once they were made aware that that was an eligible option can you go for the entire two million dollar loan or is that only for a new application I'd like to deconstruct and answer a different way. You were permitted to apply for a first time and then ask for an increase. It is our understanding you may not apply for two IDLE loans. However, I think there is, personally, I believe there could be some gray area where if your loan has not been processed and accepted, hence that October 8th deadline that we put out there, is there an opportunity to reach out to the folks at SBA and further seek a refiling. And that's something you honestly might want to reach out to one of your CPA firms that we can always help you connect with as well. So there might still be recourse and opportunity to go even further beyond that 500,000, but that's something that you might have to try to reach out to SBA to do as well. We'll go ahead and sit tight for just a, another quick 15, 20, 30 seconds or so while we're killing time, seeing if there's any other questions on the right-hand side, please put those in there, we're happy to answer it. I'd like John to give his final commentary on what do you think is gonna happen here, John? Are we gonna see a reconciliation bill emerge next week? Or are we gonna probably sit tight for two more weeks? 
Oh, I think we're going to have to sit tight for a couple more weeks. And as to your point, I think in the end, this isn't going to be done until November or December. Um, I, mean, I think Speaker Pelosi is playing chicken uh, with their caucus, try, their conference, trying to get everybody on, on the same page. And they are, there are very deep divisions between the progressives and the moderates. In the end, this is an election year. This is the one opportunity the Democrats have to pass a significant portion of President Biden's legislative agenda. And so I believe something will pass by the end of the year, but it will not be in the next week or two. Not be next week and, and may not be even in a week or two. Thank you all. Sorry we ran about five minutes late. We're hoping to keep this one to 45 minutes once a month. That is our goal. We have one more question that came in. What was the form for media acceptance? I really appreciate that. That means the folks over at Brace will get one more volunteer. So I'll let Paul uh, post that over in the chat quickly, but also we'll make sure to include that link in the follow-up email that goes out with a link to this recording and to the slide deck that you can share with your colleagues. Yes, we're glad to hear that. We will uh, post the link uh, and just fill it out. It doesn't mean that you're required to talk to the media. It means that you're. Uh, we would never send a reporter to you without uh, asking you first, and always uh, you can always say no. So thank you for the question, and we'll make sure that uh, both associations uh, members uh, get the link. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Download the podcast, listen, participate, donate. The next webinar will be Friday, October 22nd, noon Eastern. Thank you, everybody.